All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, welcome and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Bowen. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator at the Troy Savings Bank Music Hall. And we're so excited to have you all joining us this evening for the first of our three uh, virtual education events this spring. Tonight, we're gonna to be featuring uh, the musicians of our fantastic ensemble in residence, uh, Quintocracy. Um, you may have seen them earlier this year performing on our stage for other live stream events like, that we've done, like our Music at Noon concert series. Um, and they're back again with us tonight uh, to bring us this educational series. Um, they're all fantastic musicians and wonderful people. We're incredibly excited to have, us, uh, have them joining us this evening. Before we get started, I'd just like to take a moment to thank the organizations uh, that make this programming possible, National Grid and NISCA. Thank you so much. Tonight, we're going to be hearing from Quintocracy as they address the question, what in the world is a string or a wind quintet? Not a string quintet, wind quintet. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm happy to toss it over to our clarinetist, Mike D. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Michael D, and I am the clarinetist of Quintocracy, a quintet based in the capital region of upstate New York. You'll meet the other members of the group a little bit later. We're all going to be introducing our pieces as we go about this. Um, we're all really excited to be here with you tonight. So today we're going to try and answer the question, like Jess said, what in the world is a wind quintet? We're going to do that by putting together the building blocks of what makes a wind quintet so special, and we'll explore the unique sound each instrument brings to the ensemble as we go through it. So to our question, what is a wind quintet? A wind quintet is made up of five instruments, the flute, the oboe, clarinet, bassoon, and horn. Each instrument brings their own specific timbre or tone color and has different roles to play within the group. And you'll be able to sort of hear and see all of the roles that we take in all of the different pieces we've chosen for you this evening. So that brings us to our first composer, Gerald Finzi. And we're going to hear a solo clarinet piece. Gerald Finzi was born in London in 1901. He was a pacifist who believed that creative artists were the prime representatives of a civilization. And he was really well known for composing songs. He took a lot of his musical vocabulary from the music of Edward Elgar, Rayfon Williams, and even Johann Sebastian Bach. You'll especially hear Bach's influence in one of the three movements that I'm about to share with you tonight of his five bagatelles for clarinet and piano. In one of these movements, he uses a technique called the fugue. And a fugue, in very basic terms, is you have a subject that is repeated many times in different intervals. Sometimes it's repeated in reverse. Sometimes it's repeated upside down. Sometimes it's repeated in different keys. But you'll keep hearing this one theme come back, and there's a lot of interplay that happens. So be listening, because I think we might have a question for everyone watching in the middle of the performance. Um, so Finzi, he really fell in love with the unique sound of the clarinet and the wide range of rich tones the instrument had. So he decided to write this piece and it's sort of a collection of short pieces. When this piece was published in 1945, it quickly became his most popular work with the initial print run selling out within a year, which is crazy for, for back in 1945. He was really confused at the success this piece had and was quoted saying that they're only trifles. They're not worth much, but they get better notices than my decent stuff. What's this? So I like this piece because it's one of my favorite pieces to perform, and I'm really excited to share it with you today. Here are three of the five movements of Finzi's five bagatelles for clarinet and piano.
Thank you very much. So the room that I was in, ooh, that's awesome. So it looks like three people got the answer correct. Movement five, which also the title kind of gave it away. Fugetta is like a little fugue. So the little theme, ba ba dum bum, be 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 dum, be dee dee da dee dee dum. That was the thing that was repeated the entire time in different ways. So the room I was in might look a little familiar. It might look like this room because this concert was sort of recorded in many different stages within the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, all of the rest of the pieces that you'll see tonight were all recorded in the Troy Savings Bank Music Hall. But this piece was recorded a fairly long time ago while we were sort of getting ready and before I was able to get my vaccine. So anyway, um, the next piece on our program is going to be introduced by our flutist, Melanie. There we go. <laughs> All right. So, um, I should sit. <laughs> um, my piece is by uh, the British composer Ian Clark. And I think when you are studying an instrument, it's awesome to have like a flute hero. And he's definitely one of mine because he not only performs really beautifully, but he's a really great composer. And I love playing his works a lot. Um, why is it so bright? We broke the camera. Oh, we, we broke, broke the it. camera. Okay. Ah! Um, in any case, um, like I said, he's a composer, he's a flutist, and he's also a teacher. And there we go. Okay. <laughs> he's worked extensively with um, the musician and composer Simon Painter, who's a pianist, um, in producing music for film and television. And I think you kind of can tell in his kind of the kind of compositions that he does. So this piece, The Great Train Race, makes use of a lot of extended techniques. And extended techniques is just um, a more modern way of playing the flute. And this piece is called the Great Train Race. So the flute gets to imitate the train. So you're going to hear some um, like residual breathy sounds like. So it's not actually blowing enough air to make a sound. And then you're going to hear some train whistle sounds, which are multiphonics, which means two notes at once. So the composer kind of writes. He shows you, I don't know if you can see. Yeah. Okay, he'll give you alternate fingering so that you can play two notes at once, basically. And then you just have to blow kind of a little bit strangely to get them out. So here's what a multiphonic might sound like. And then there's another way of getting multiphonics, which is singing and playing, and that'll sound like this. So singing and playing at the same time. So you'll hear all three in this piece. And without further ado, I hope you enjoy The Great Train Race by Ian Clark. Thank 
Such a cool piece of music. So now that we've heard how the clarinet sounds and how the flute sounds separately, let's put them together. This is the first building block of the wind quintet. So the piece that is next on our program that sort of shows that to the best of its possible ability is a piece by Robert Muczynski and it's his duos for flute and clarinet. So Robert Muczynski was a Polish American composer who lived from 1929 to 2010 um, he received his bachelor's and master's degrees in piano performance from DePaul University in Chicago. And eventually he ended up joining the piano composition and music theory faculty at DePaul University. What stands out in Muczynski's music was his use of really accented and rhythmically driven fast movements and really slow lyrical and flowy slow movements. And you'll hear that in the three movements that we've chosen for you today. His duos were originally written for two flutes in 1974, but the composer himself rearranged this for flute and clarinet in 1991 after hearing the virtuosity of flutist Julius Baker and clarinetist Mitchell Lurie. When he rearranged it, he rewrote the parts to reflect the full range and abilities of the players. And you can hear that in the music and you can also hear how he kind of shifted parts. And there are times where you might not find out what instruments playing because it sort of sounds like one really big instrument there are lots of huge dynamic changes from very very soft to very very loud and a lot of different characters and colors that are present throughout so we're going to take a listen to this and hear really how well the flute and the clarinet can blend together so here are a couple movements of robert muczynski's duos for flute and clarinet.
I think that's such a cool piece of music. I always envision in my head like a little imp dancing around, chasing after somebody in that last movement, which I think is really cool. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about with that too, that just came to my mind as we were listening is in the first movement, something really cool that happens when two wind instruments can play really well in tune together, you'll start feeling vibrations in your ears of all of the overtones in the series. And you can actually hear just a little bit at the very beginning of the first movement that we were playing when we start to expand our dynamic ranges as Muczynski wrote for us. So to introduce the next building block and an unusual one, I'm going to introduce our hornist, Catherine Svatek. Hello. As Mike said, I'm Catherine Svatek, and I am the horn player in the wind quintet and quintocracy. And yes, the horn is a brass instrument. Um, but it's a wind quintet. And the reason for that is the, the tone color, the sound of the horn blends really well with the colors of the rest of the woodwinds. Um, so we get to play in both brass sections and in woodwind sections. You see it in orchestral music all the time as well. Um, and so it's a lot of fun. We get to play. It's, it's a very different style of playing as well. I often find myself, I've done more woodwind quintet playing than brass quintet playing. And I always have to remind myself in a brass quintet, I have to be like big and loud and quite often more like marching bandish. Whereas the wooden quintet brings out the more delicate side of horn playing. Um, and so the next piece you're going to hear is a duet for horn and flute, which is kind of an odd combination. It's not one that's really written for very much. Um, but the composer Jan Bach is, or what, he actually just passed away in October. So he was a horn player. And these, this piece, it's called Two-Bit Contraptions, which is a play on words from Johann Bach's two-part inventions for keyboard. So hopefully I will keep saying it correctly. Two-Bit Contraptions. It's a set of four pieces. Um, we will be playing two, and they were actually written during his tenure in the US Army Band um, out of Washington, DC in the 1960s. And he wrote them for a former student of his who was a horn player, obviously, and her roommate was a flutist. So he thought it would be a fun, a fun gift for her. Um, but they actually never got to play it. And it was premiered by two high school students down in St. Petersburg, Florida, which is, it's interesting. I can't imagine having played this piece as a high school student, honestly. Um, so the two movements we will be playing are Calliope, and the gramophone. So a calliope is, is a merry-go-round, for those of you who might not have heard that term. And the gramophone is, is a record player. And so there's some little quirks with each of these movements. Um, it's, it's very quirky. And <laughs> to, it, one of the quotes from his own notes was, uh, to the composer's eternal embarrassment, it remains his most frequently performed composition. So he kind of wrote it as a joke. And now it's like the thing that everybody plays of his. So one of the things I want you to listen for, um, the calliope is a fun, quirky, uh, quirky little merry-go-round. Um, each part is designed to stand on its own. And I, I can totally hear that practicing it myself, that it could be a solo piece. Um, so that's a fun one. But then the gramophone, for those of you who remember no record players, quite often they would start to skip. And so it's fun because you hear the general sound of the horn. You'll get the open sound in the calliope. For the gramophone, I muted, which gives it a little more far away sound. The kind of tinny sound that you would often get from a record player. And quite often, I'll actually be tapping the mute to emulate the pops on a record player. So I want you to listen when we get to the gramophone movement for how often you hear that little pop and the music itself will repeat because of course when it's skipping you get the same little one second of music over and over again until it moves on. So listen for that um, in these two movements from two part, nope, two bit contraptions <laughs> by Jan Bach. <laughs> Thank you. 
such a cool piece of music. So Katie, the answers are in. We've got zero folks for I heard it once, three for I heard it five times, two for I heard it 10 times, and two for I heard it more than 15 times. Yeah, so it's a little bit of a trick question because so there are basically, there are four little sections of music that skipped. Um, that there's the first go, ba, 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 da, ba, da. and then there was, da, 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 da. There's few. so there were four little sections that, so I had 18 little pops. I was kind of doing some little set work over here with one hand clicking and the other hand trying to play all the right notes. So um, many of you got it, depending on how you read the question, it like, sounds like a lot of you got a whole bunch. Oh, I can't speak tonight. I'm sorry. You got it. You got it. <laughs> right. Nice job. <laughs> I'm trying to read and talk at the same time. Don't do that. <laughs> and I don't know if anybody caught that very, I forgot to mention that last little glissando in the horn is the, the needle scraping across the record, which yeah. you're not supposed to do. You're supposed to lift it up gently. So very cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. That was awesome. So just a quick reminder, anybody who has a question throughout this, if you look at the bottom of your zoom screen and click on that little Q and a button, you can type a question for us that we can either answer live or we can answer in the chat or we can answer how, however we'd like to answer. So please feel free to ask any questions you'd like throughout and we would be happy to answer them for you. Um, so the next building block, we've had one person multiple times. We've had two people multiple times. Now let's add a third. We're gonna send it over to, to Mr. William Safford on bassoon. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is William Safford, and I am your bassoonist for Quintocracy. This is a bassoon. It's kind of big. It's got about nine feet of tubing. And it's a double reed instrument. Both the oboe and the bassoon are what we call double reed instruments. The reason for that is because we have two reeds that are strapped together. And this is how you initiate the sound. But when you put it in the instrument, you can play music. So the roles of the bassoon in the quintet are varied. I can be the bass instrument. Or I can play the melody. Or I can play harmonies. So I can do many different things in the, in the quintet. The bassoon can play low. It can play medium. And it could even go a little bit higher than that. It's a beautiful instrument and I love playing it. So our next work this evening is by Franz Josef Haydn, his London Trio number no. three in G major. It was originally written for two flutes and cello performed by Quintocracy this evening on flute, oboe and bassoon, three members of Quintocracy. Haydn was an Austrian composer of the late 18th century. He was a friend of Mozart, a teacher of Beethoven, and a composer of over 100 symphonies and 68 string quartets, as well as many other works. Today, if you want to listen to music, you can turn on the radio or TV or listen to it on your computer or cell phone, just as you're doing right now. 200 years ago, if you wanted to listen to music, you either had to perform it yourself or listen to someone else perform it live. Haydn spent most of his career in the service of the wealthy Hungarian Esterházy family at their Esterháza castle. Haydn was, in essence, a servant in the Esterházy court. He wrote music and organized concerts and performances on a regular schedule for his employer, Prince Esterházy. Everything from orchestra concerts, to puppet plays, to background music for dinner parties. Later in life, Haydn was granted a pension 
and permitted to sell his composition to, and to travel. On two occasions, he traveled to London, England, where he was welcomed with open arms. During the second of these trips, in about 1794, he composed the four London trios for an English aristocrat, Willoughby Bertie, the fourth Earl of Abingdon, to perform. The Earl was a lover of music and an able amateur flutist. Quintocracy presents the third of the four trios.
Such a beautiful performance. I think my favorite thing about listening to that piece is that you can really hear what an amazing hall the Troy Savings Bank Music Hall is. It makes all of the louds that much louder. It makes all the softs that much softer. You can hear so much definition. It's been such a pleasure and a joy to be able to spend some time in there recording all these pieces. So for our next piece, we're going to hear another version of a trio, three instruments. And I'm going to send this over to Melanie to talk about it. So our next trio is going to include oboe, flute, and clarinet, the Malcolm Arnold trio. And Malcolm Arnold was um, a, an amazing trumpet player and also a composer. And once he started composing, he kind of dropped the performing bit. Um, but he was he wrote a lot. He's a very prolific composer. He wrote film scores, symphonies, ballets, operas, concertos. Uh, and a considerable quantity of chamber music. So today we're going to play for you the divertimento in six movements. 
And um, I just want to read to you a little quote. He said that um, music is a social act of communication among people, a gesture of friendship, the strongest there is. So saying, Malcolm Arnold firmly nailed his creative colors to the mast, whether in, the, um, whether in his Cornish dances or his patriotic pieces. Um, he has this emotional openness and sincerity that is rare in composers of his generation. So giving you a little bit of the feel of his piece, let's take a listen to it.
Very cool. That piece in particular, I think, really exemplifies how each of the roles of the flute, clarinet, and the oboe can shift throughout the course of playing together. We all took on roles of accompaniment, of solo, of support. It was all really nice. So our question, as you listen, consider some similarities and differences between this piece, Divertimento, and the Haydn London trio we heard. Select the similarity or difference that stands out to you below. So our answer was... The textures in this piece are different. The instruments interact differently playing in the Haydn. Then, sorry, interact differently, yes, differently playing in the Haydn. That was six of 10. Five of 10, melodies differ in their sound. London Trio sounded more traditional, while the Arnold Divertimento sounded more modern. Or one, for they both have the same instrumentation, clarinet, oboe, and flute. So, what was the answer, friends? Anybody? Anyone? So many things. All of these, except for the first one, are pretty well correct. So, to talk about our next piece, introduce a fourth instrument into the quintet. We're almost at the full five. I'm going to hand it over to Will. Hello again. Our next piece is a quartet for flute, oboe, clarinet, and bassoon, no horn yet, by Leos Janacek, Three Moravian Dances. Janacek was a late 19th and early 20th century European composer from what is now the Czech Republic. He wrote operas, works for orchestra, chamber music, including a major work written with the wind quintet in mind, Melody Youth, for wind sextet, flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, horn, plus guest bass clarinet. And he wrote a bunch more as well. These three dances were originally written for piano. They were discovered in Janacek's papers after he passed away. They incorporate folk themes that Janacek collected over the years. A Czech flutist, Milan Munklinger, arranged them for Woodwind Quartet. These three charming little pieces were written almost exactly 100 years after the Haydn Trio. They were written in 1892 and 1894. As you listen to them, think about the ways in which they sound different from the Haydn Trio. Thank you. 
So as you can hear, the sound of the group when you add more instruments gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we're going to hear some more shortly um, in our next two pieces. So the next two pieces, ooh, we have the poll results. So let's see, we've got two for, there's a fourth instrument, the bassoon. So we're looking for some similarities and differences between the two, what stands out. So fourth instrument, bassoon, two people. This one has a different color. The mood is different from Haydn. We've got one person. Three people voted for the instruments play different roles in this piece. Every instrument gets to play the melody. Good, good, good. And two people voted for the oboe, clarinet, and flute all interact in similar ways between the two pieces. And that answer was a trick answer because there is no clarinet in the Haydn trio. Ha ha ha. Everything else was wonderful. So everyone's learning. Now, to talk about what happens when you add the fifth and final person into the quintet, I'm going to send this over to Katie. And before I have her talk, the cool thing about these two pieces is that they show the quintet in two very different styles. And we'll get into that anyway. All right. So the piece you're about to hear is by a female composer named Amy Beach. Um, is she the only female composer in this program? Yes, she is. We just did an entirely women composers program a couple weeks ago, so I, I honestly couldn't remember. <laughs> I'm sorry. So she was really notable. She was born in 1867. Um, so that was a time when women weren't really supposed to have careers as we get to now. Um, and so she is, a, she was a true musical child prodigy by, let's see, by the age of one, she could sing 40 songs accurately. <laughs> by age two, she could improvise a counter melody. Um, so going against like, yeah, singing a bass line against a, the, the melody, for example, she was able to read by age three. At age four, she mentally composed three waltzes for piano. She didn't have one at her house at the time, but she just, she did it at her grandfather's farm. Um, and then was able to come home and play them. And then she could play four part hymns by ear as well. That boggles my mind. Um, as the group knows, I have a three and a half year old and a five year old. They're pretty musically, comp more than musically competent. I like to say they can't do any of that. I love them, but we're not there. That's okay. <laughs> um, but she did start formal piano lessons at the age of six. Not so uncommon, but um, she became quite a concert pianist at the age of 16 and, and debuted in Boston. And all of that came to a screeching halt two years later when she turned 18 and got married. Um, so first off, she was married at age 18. That doesn't happen as much anymore. Um, I can't imagine having been married half a lifetime ago for me. Um, and her husband wouldn't let her perform anymore. He, he did kind of concede and say that she could compose and everything was written under the name Mrs. H.H.A. Beach. So she didn't even really get to be herself. And this really strikes a chord with me. Um, I'm Catherine Spottek, that is my maiden name. I didn't change my name when I got married. Um, my husband actually, and his mother actually told me not to because I was already fairly well established in this area um, as a player and a teacher. And so they said, no, why would you become Mrs. Samuel Johnson or Katie Johnson? There's a billion Katie Johnsons. Why would you change your name? And so the fact that she not only had to change her name because you couldn't not at the time and then had to compose on her, you know, she didn't even get to be Amy Beach really at that point. Um, so I'm very honored to be able to have had that privilege to stay myself as I've, as I've become a performer. Um, a little bit about her music. She was the first female composer of large scale art music. Her, she wrote a piece called the Gaelic Symphony, <clears throat> which was the first symphony composed and published by an American woman. And it was premiered by the Boston Symphony. Um, so it was no joke. And then she also became, um, there was a group of composers that became known as the Second New England School. Um, they all kind of worked together and, and kind of bounced ideas off of each other. And she was the only female and she was the youngest. So it was a pretty notable thing. Um, the piece you're about to hear is a pastoral. Um, it is for the, written for the wind quintet. So it's much smaller scale. And a pastoral is, um, it evokes nature. So 
as you listen, there's not necessarily one particular melody. It's just all meant to evoke this feeling of being outside somewhere. And it might be different for everybody. Um, so as you listen to this, just kind of try to, to think about what's going on outside or where you might see yourself as you hear this. Um, and we can uh, see what everybody says at the end. I believe there's a poll for this one as well. So um, this is, and as Mike said, this is a nice way to introduce adding the horn back into the group because it's not this huge bombastic piece. Um, so you'll get to hear kind of a gentle introduction to the full wind quintet in Amy Beach's Pastoral. <laughs> piece gives me all the warm fuzzies. So nice. Such a beautiful piece of music. So let's see what the majority of folks said. So no one thinks this reminds them of the beach. A majority of people, eight people say a forest, four people say the mountains, no one says the desert, no one says the city. And one person says it reminds them of something else. Well, Hopefully. actually, it did appear that Amy Beach preferred being in like parks and the woodlands. Hmm. So and I think she actually did some of her writing just kind of like sitting outside. So well done for those of you who said forest and mountains are pretty foresty too. So very cool. Very, very cool. Awesome. So for our final piece of this evening and probably one of the more exciting pieces we like to play, I am going to pass the microphone over to Kelly, our oboist. Hi everybody. Am I? Okay, good. We're good to go. So before I get into the program notes for this, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to thank everybody who have made this uh, concert series possible. We have a few more concerts coming up in a similar uh, vein as this one. So introducing, you know, endangered woodlands and then what's the other one that we're doing? 
I forget the third one. <laughs> Talking about our musical story. And how we how we came to be. Um, so thank you so much to the Troy Savings Bank Music Hall for hosting us, allowing us to become artists in residence and be a part of you know the the community engagement that we're all working to achieve with music. Because as we know, um, you know, music is something that is not uh, not as valued by some people as it should be. But then when they realize that they don't have it, of course, everybody's like, oh my gosh, we need music. So thank you so much to Troy Savings Bank Music Hall for letting us help out and be a part of this. Thank you to the sponsors for this concert. Um, a big thank you to uh, the hall also for allowing us to record there, um, helping us you know, find time to be in such a wonderful space. We really appreciate it. And a quick shout out to the Guild on Music Academy and Capital District Creative Learning Center as well, because they did allow us to rehearse together and uh, help put this together. So as Mike said, we were sort of working around the pandemic, everybody getting their vaccines. As you can see, we're unmasked together. We've all been fully vaccinated at this point, but you probably noticed Mike a couple of times with his with his playing mask on. And, um, you know, it's been really fun to try to figure out how we can do this safely, how to rehearse, how to put this together. And, you know, with incredible amounts of work from Mr. Mike himself putting these videos together as well. So thank you to everybody who have made this possible tonight. Um, so I'd like to introduce our last piece, uh, which is um, Molly on the Shore, which is written by Percy Granger. And that might be a very familiar uh, title for a piece for those of you who have been in a wind ensemble before and perhaps an orchestra. So um, Percy Granger wrote this piece in 1907, and it was actually originally written for strings, and then it's been adapted several different times, many different ways for many different iterations of winds. Um, it, it's an arrangement of two contrasting Irish reels, one of which is called Temple Hill and one of which is called Molly on the Shore. So that's you know where we get the namesake from. These two reels present melodies in a variety of textures and orchestrations, giving each section of the ensemble that's playing it. So this specifically said band, but every section of the ensemble gets these nice long uh, melodic materials that they get to play with contrasting stuff happening all around them. So it's, it's actually, it's really fun to play. It's really fun to sort of pick out where the thematic material is. And it's interesting to see the different permutations of who comes in together with what melody, who's doing the harmony, who's doing what here. Um, so this piece uh, was originally written um, as a birthday present for his mother. So Percy Granger and his mother happened to be very close and he um, you know, created this piece and wrote it for her. And uh, after he had written a string version of it, which was the original setting, um, he did have an arrangement that was made, it appeared in 1920. And so we are doing a woodwind quintet version of it. So if you've heard the string arrangement, if you've heard the, the wind ensemble arrangement, it's, it's quite something to behold. It's fast, it's fun, it's exciting. Um, and we are going to try to, we are going to replicate that. We are going to successfully replicate that with the five of us together. Um, so one of the things I do want to point out is, um, you know, originally written for strings, I think one of the things that kind of comes to mind for me is just the fact that it's hard to breathe in this piece. There are a lot of notes we are playing straight through. So, um, you know, each one of us, I think, had to do some pretty serious work to make sure that, you know, we could go through it successfully. But one of the things I kind of want to highlight is the fact that the clarinet is playing for almost the entire piece. He's, you know, sort of kind of a feature here. And you might actually catch him doing sort of an extended technique, which is called circular breathing. So if you kind of pay attention towards the end, um, watch his cheeks because uh, Mr. Mike is a is a uh, fantastic clarinetist and he has the ability to circular breathe so he could potentially play a note forever like a literal never <laughs> melody so you know keep your eyes peeled for some of this exciting stuff so again thank you so much from from quintocracy to every single person organization that listener, listener yeah, and, and thank you to the audience for being here tonight without you this absolutely would not be possible so Please enjoy Molly on the Shore by Percy Granger. <laughs> Thank you. 
Such a fun and terrifying piece to play. Um, so, oh, oh my goodness. How in the world? People voted twice? So 13 out of 13 voted for dancing, but people also voted for sitting, talking, eating, and something else. Interesting. Um, the other cool thing about that piece is that everyone else has three pages of music, and I have so many notes that I have five pages of music, so I had to use two stands to record that. Um, thank you again, everyone, so much. I'm going to pass the microphone back over to Jess so she can close out everything and start the Q&A. Yeah, thanks so much to, firstly, Quitocracy for putting all this together. This has been a really great uh, series of recordings and performances and really interesting evening. Um, so thank you so much. And again, thank you to the audience um, for attending. We're so excited to have had you for this first of three live stream performances um, with Quintocracy. Our next one will be on Friday, May 14th at the same time. Um, so if you'd like to join us for that, you can check that out on our website um, and register for our next one again on May 14th. Um, so with that, um, we have a couple minutes here. We'll finish up. If anybody has any questions for the group, any questions at all, you can go ahead and 
type it in the Q&A section and we'll answer your questions. Ooh, I see this. So I'm going to answer this one live from Wendy De La Cruz. Ellie, who wants to play the clarinet next year, is wondering what the best part of playing the clarinet is. Oh, gosh, there are so many, so many great parts about playing the clarinet. I think for me, the best part about playing the clarinet is that you get to wear as many hats as you want. You get to play every little bit of music. You can play the melody. You can play the harmony. You get to support. You get to be in the forefront. I think it's really cool. You get to play jazz, you can play classical, you get to do a little bit of everything. So that's, that is the best part of playing clarinet to me. A great question. Anybody else that might have any questions, feel free to type it on in. So we have from an anonymous attendee, what other instruments do you each play? I'll, since I am unmuted, I will. Ooh, Kelly's going to answer this live. Ooh, I'll let Kelly go. I mean, I, I think we accidentally clicked that, but um, I actually have a, I have a background in music education, so I can technically play all the band instruments, but you don't want to hear it. But I do play flute. Same. I do play flute okay. I play English horn as well. I play bassoon, saxophone, um, and attempted some brass and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah. And same. I have I have a degree in music ed as well, so we we did have to learn them all for that. But I have played played piano since I was four, um, and I sing. And uh, I taught guitar and ukulele for a while as well as all the woodwinds. Um, so really. I think the only things I haven't played in the last 10 years are the oboe and the bassoon, honestly. Um, it's been since college for that, but uh, <laughs> you really don't want me to. Currently, mostly horn, um, some trumpet, some trombone, and then a lot, of, a lot more piano. Yeah, um, so same music I'm <laughs> Um but I, I play the piano as well. Not, not a, like a professional <laughs> because I don't practice it as much as I do the right. flute, but yeah. And I have a performance degree and I play contrabassoon as well as bassoon professionally. In fact, uh, with orchestra work, I probably play more contrabassoon than I do bassoon, which is one of the reasons why it's fun to be able to be in a quintet. It gives me more opportunity to uh, use my bassoon chops. I also play saxophone at an amateur level just for fun. Nice. And for me, I was not a music ed degree major. I was a performance major as well. Um, but I play all of the clarinets, all of which the bass clarinet and the E flat you'll hear on one of our upcoming streams are um, endangered instruments concert. Um, the saxophones, I play a very mediocre flute um, and probably beginning level piano. I'm no piano well enough to teach very, very young students, but not much more than that. Um, so that's what I play. So we have another question here that I think is going to be for Mr. Will. You mentioned bass clarinet earlier. What other instrumental permutations of the woodwind ensemble are written for? Uh, there are several different ones. Well, there can be as many as a composer wants to write for and the musicians want to play. Uh, but besides for the wind quintet and some of the smaller versions of it, like you've heard this evening, a very common one is the piano sextet. So it'll be the wind quintet plus a piano. Uh, there are some wonderful pieces written for that combination, including uh, the Poulenc sextet. Uh, and there are quite a few others as well. Uh, another one you often hear is with the bass clarinet. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, that Janacek wrote a beautiful and very challenging work um, called Melody for wind quintet plus bass clarinet. Uh, sometimes you'll hear alto saxophone. Sometimes you'll hear other instruments. I've encountered ones with trumpet or with trombone or other instruments. And sometimes it'll get to be a larger ensemble. For example, if you combine it with strings, uh, instruments. There's a magnificent work that I hope we will perform in the future uh, called, oh, what is, oh, it went right out of my head. Uh, um, shoot, oh well, 20th century composer. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, one that I really enjoy and that we performed a year ago in the music hall is when you get to add a contrabassoon. 
uh, and we played a work by a living Canadian composer, Mathieu Lussier, uh, for Wind Quintet plus uh, Contrabassoon. And I actually played the Contrabassoon in that, and it was a great deal of fun and a lot of work. Nice. Awesome. And now we have another one from Lauren Thomas. Who is your favorite composer to play? Who wants to take this one first? I'm happy to go first if you all want to think about it a little bit. Go. Um, my favorite composer to play is, oh my goodness. How have I forgotten his name? Uh, Samuel Barber. That is my favorite composer to play. <laughs> it's one of those things, goes in your head, jumps right back out. Um, Samuel Barber. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you guys were laughing at me? <laughs> I was looking up at this guy. Um, <laughs> um, but Samuel Barber, I really love his piece for Wind Quintet Summer Music. That was my first introduction to performing some of his pieces. Um, and since have really fallen in love, like Knoxville Summer of 1915 is a really beautiful piece for solo uh, soprano and orchestra. That's gorgeous and so much fun to play. So that's my favorite composer to perform. I think mine would probably have to be Ricard Strauss. Um, he has his first horn concerto is really well known. I actually prefer the second one. It's harder, so this, you, like high schoolers don't do it as often. Um, so not as many people know it, um, but it's it's a lot of fun. And then he has all his tone poems for orchestra. And his dad was a horn player, so he always has some really great horn parts. Um, we get to be very heroic in many of his pieces. So that's probably probably my favorite orchestral composer. And then I, I'm i Czech and Dvorak just is a lot more to listen to, but also to play, to be perfectly honest. I am an oboist, so a lot of my music is uh, very, very old. And there's a lot of new stuff that's been composed as well. But um, I would say that um, Actually, there is a Strauss oboe concerto. Mm -hmm. Is it Ricard as well? I, I his father was also Franz was also a composer. So. I think it's I think it's R. Strauss. But I, so. um, I loved playing that piece. It's like a little. Uh, it was like one of the last pieces that he had written, and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, but I love to play Bach, any Bach, all mm -hmm. Bach. I feel like oboe was just made to do that. Um, so I really enjoy playing Bach, and my favorite key along with that is G G minor. Um, so there's a couple of things written in G minor, and every time I play it, I'm just like, Ooh. so, yeah. Um, I think I like different composers depending on my mood, but I, I actually like yeah. more modern stuff, so I like to play with electronics a lot. So <laughs> stuff like Ian Clark or Flutronics, uh, that kind of stuff is fun. <laughs> my favorite work, or my favorite composer um, would be Mahler, Gustav Mahler. Uh, he... This, he wrote beautiful bassoon parts, but even better, he wrote magnificent contra bassoon parts. And I just revel in them whenever I get the chance to play them. Uh, Richard Strauss, Shostakovich, those are other examples uh, of composers whose music I love to play. Uh, and then in terms of the concerti, bassoon concerti, the Mozart, Mozart just it's it's the gold standard in the bassoon repertoire for uh, for solos and it's just beautiful by the way i remembered what the piece is that i was trying to remember earlier for wind quintet plus strings martinu nonet mid 20th century composer it is absolutely gorgeous i was uh one time chatting with the uh um with the music critic uh, norman lebrecht and he, we both agreed that it's one of our favorite works and it's just oh, it's just luscious and I hope we get a chance to play it sometime. I hope so too. That would be really cool. Um, I do want to bring out Tim Solinger wrote a really awesome question in the chat. Um, this year has been really tough for music performances and I bet it's been really discouraging for some kids in band, choir and orchestra. What would you tell the students out there to encourage them to keep going in spite of the challenges of the past year? It's a big question. Um, I, I'll take first if it's fine with my friends. Yeah. Um, for me, I think playing music is such a healing experience and playing music with other people and being able to communicate with people in that specific way. For me, all of the challenges of trying to figure out all of this 
throughout the last year and playing music and keeping music up, being able to come back together eventually and play with this group again has healed me more than I think I thought it could. So I feel like I'm going to start crying. So I'm going to pass it over to Kelly <laughs> or that, that group over there first. But for me, I, it's, it's such a healing thing to play music. And I think just holding out and being able to have those interactions with your peers and, and be together and in that kind of ensemble, I think it's totally worth it to be able to keep going. Yeah. Um, it definitely has been tough um, for, for all of us. And, and this is what we do. And it's been really hard. Uh, I think Melanie probably was able to keep going the most through a lot of it. I know for me with, with a big family, it was, it was hard to find the time to practice um, while having all of us in the house all the time and, and everything. And so I think for, for students, just honestly, I mean, yes, you need to do what you need to do for your lessons and, and for school but just find what feels good. If it feels good to just play something that you're making up or you have a Harry Potter songbook or whatever, just do it. It, it Music should be fun. Um, that's that's what, one of the things we love about our group is we're here to have fun and make great music and we all get along. It, it's, it's a pretty great combination. Um, if you have access to technology like acapella or anything where you can record one part and then play a duet with yourself, it's it's still not the same as being with other people, but it's still pretty cool to say, hey, I just made a, a quartet of myself mm -hmm. um, or even a duet or something. Or if you play piano, you can record a piano part and then your solo part, anything like that. And um, so if you have access to that, there are plenty of free options as well. Um, online, I believe Soundtrap is, is available. Um, and to jump on that thought. Um, on YouTube, I found more accompaniments yes. this year <laughs> than ever before because there are pianists that are just making yeah. like their accompaniment tracks for you. So like I, I found it like I did a few concerts for GMA that way where I was like mm -hmm. camp music and me like Mike did on the first. Yeah, piece. my first piece was that same thing. I found this guy who had all these wonderful pieces. I think he has 400 different clarinet accompaniments and you can find anything for any instrument that he does and still be able to perform. So. And, and with the weather getting nicer, um, if you are able to grab a friend and go play in the backyard, some like that's how we survived last summer. All right, <laughs> everybody came to my house because I had no child care. I was like, you can come rehearse at my house outside, and my kids are going to be in the midst. And it worked. <laughs> we made it and work. Our neighbors were so sweet too. <laughs> like we got so many compliments. We did so much. Um, I think so much kids interpretive dance to us. Oh yeah, yeah, kids were in the yard. You know, it was yeah. just it was something else to be able to sit back barefoot in a backyard when it's nice and warm out and play together. We're dodging bugs. We're you know trying to find the shade spots as the sun kind of moved around. But you know, I think that what I would tell people too is like. It's, it's just not to give up because, you know, there, there's either, either things are going to go back to normal or there's going to be a new normal and we can adapt to whatever we're doing. So, you know, for, for younger students, find a way to set yourself goals, find a way to set yourself the performances, because that's really what it's all about is, you know, having fun, having a good time and bringing yourself to a point where you've got something to look forward to with your playing, whether it's like, I'm going to be able to play Harry Potter on the xylophone or I'm going to perform for, you know, 30 or 40 people just online. Just find ways to keep yourself engaged and give yourself goals to work towards because, you know, the first couple of times that we did get together to play, <laughs> it was it was emotional for us. It was really nice. You know, we were we were not out of shape, but we were, we missed each other. We missed playing together. And when we got to play together, it was amazing. So it'll happen for everybody else too. It's gonna, it's something's gonna give, something's gonna happen. So yeah. just keep up the hope. I'll just emphasize, this is temporary. It's going to get better. This too shall pass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So we have time, I think for one more question. And this one is for Melanie. Okay. So I'll just try and be brief on this. Um, I was lucky enough to have a flute teacher in high school that really emphasized musicality. And so my favorite part of flute playing is just coming up with different phrasing ideas. Like, you know how you could say the grass is green, the grass is green, the grass is green. Like you can say it a different, a month, like a million different ways. And like, that's what we do with music as artists. And that's my favorite part. 
Very cool. <laughs> I think that's how she explained it to me, too. <laughs> that's, a really good, that's a really good, really good way to phrase, to phrase it. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you. Again, thank you so much for everybody attending this evening. This was a blast. Again, we hope to see you all on May 14th for the second um, educational live stream from Quintocracy. We're super excited about it. Um, but otherwise, have a fantastic evening, everyone. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.